Uh, I'm David Solomonoff, the president of the New York chapter of the Internet Society, and we're here uh, to talk about public interest commitments for the premium.nyc domain names that we have today. Uh, in not in any particular order, uh, Alvary Doria, Gabriel Levitt, Tom Lowenhaupt, and coming in remotely, uh, Tim McGinnis. And Aubrey is going to we're going to have a couple of brief presentations and then Q&A afterwards. We're going to start with Aubrey and try to avoid the feedback. Uh, Aubrey Doria is a member of the ICANN GNSO Council as, as a representative of the non-commercial stakeholder group, that's the NCSG. Uh, she was the chair of the GNSO Council at the time. The policy for the current round of GLT, GTLDs, top level domains, was finalized. In the current ICANN GTLD environment, she specializes in community TLD applications and is currently involved with .gay LLC, working with the LGBTQI community and the public interest registry, helping establish their community advisory council for .ngo and .ong, is that correct? Yes, okay. which is the Spanish and French. Oh, Spanish and French version of NGO. Right, and she's also a member of the UN Working Group on Enhanced Cooperation, that's the WGEC, and of the Internet Governance Forum Multi-Stakeholder Advisory Group, the IGF-MAG. And she's a former member of the UN Working Group on Internet Governance, WGIG, and spent five years as a member of the, uh, the Internet Governance Forum, IGF Secretariat. As a, technolo a technologist, she's been involved in the development of uh, internet protocols and architectures for over 30 years is a participant in the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, and a past chair of the IRTF Routing Research Group. And she's currently the author of multiple RFCs and occasionally teaches on internet governance subjects. Aubrey also has organized her own research consultancy, Technicalities, and she does part-time volunteer, as a part-time volunteer researcher for the Association for Progressive Communications. She's currently on the board of ISOC New York, us, and it was also awarded the ICANN Multi-Stakeholder Ethos Award in 2014. So obviously I'm a great believer in alphabet soup. Um, and, and, and I love acronyms and I don't think I could write a bio without many of them. So this, this is an interesting conversation for me to, to be involved in because public interest commitments were not part of this new GTLD program at all. When we put together the policy, we made absolutely no constraints upon uh, what could be taken as a top level domain and we did nothing that even came close to content control of what somebody could do at the second level domain. We, when we put together the policy in the first place, we had no rules about uh, cities having something to say about TLDs that, that uh, were, were formed using their name. We had no rules about country-based TLDs. We basically sort of opened up the market wide and sort of said, come one, come all, apply, as long as you live within the law of wherever you happen to be and aren't breaking it, go ahead, do what you're gonna do. Uh, now, and, and, and that was the policy. And by ICANN rules, once this policy was accepted, this was really the policy that they were supposed to implement. Well, they didn't. Um, lots of people started to complain. We had governments complaining and saying, how could you let someone use a name that's important to us, you know, without, regulating them and I said well it's just a word you know and, and in fact we've gotten it with the applications of people in South America saying how dare an American company apply for the word Amazon you know that that's our word we own that word even though they don't use that word they say Amazonia and they spell it different but it's their word and so you had government sort of saying well if it's the name of a country you know you can't let people have it or if it's the name of a major city, you can't let people have it. And the, the GAC, the Government Advisory Committee, which, which has a special role inside ICANN, you know, uh, basically went to the board and said, you can't do this. 
Now, when the GAC says the board can't do something, the board has to negotiate with them. The board can decide not to do what they want, but, but they have to go through an involved process. Well, in, the vol in this process, the board sort of said, well, we don't really care what the policy said. When it's, when it's a city that's a big known city, when it's a capital, when it's a country, you know, you gotta get permission of the, the, the rulers of that nation, state, city, what have you. And, and you can only get those major names if you have permission. But beyond that, still no commitments. Then later with the, with the GAC, they sort of said, but there's these regulated industries and there's these other things and, and we're afraid that people will abuse these names. So they created these, these PICs, those, those public interest commitments that were sort of, I, I see them as warts that were stuck on to the side of applications after the applications were already in. In other words, I can again sort of created some ad hoc policy to sort of make the GAC and others happy and sort of say, we'll have picks. Now, I was working with community applicants at the moment. If, if anybody paid any attention to what the community, community applicants, if you are applying as a community, if you are applying as a community, you had to take a whole lot of extra steps. You had to explain how you were related to the community, how you were gonna protect the community, how you were going to basically have rules that regulated how the community had access to the name. And if you could prove that you had done that properly and you had the community's support, you would actually have priority in, in, in getting a name. Now, when they went and, and, and they came out and they sort of said, if you're, you're a city, you can have it, they didn't say, but you have to be a community. And in, in communities like the one I was working with, working with the LGBTQIA community, um, basically, we have three competitors who basically did not apply as community. But they were told, hey, you know, you could put a public interest commitment on. But public interest commitments are really meaningless at, at the moment because they have no enforcement value. There's no third party um, addressing of those. So in other words, you have to, even when there is a pick, you have to be a directly injured party. You cannot be in an advocacy group that, for example, says, you know, we have Dot Apache here, and in their, their, their pick in their, you know, uh, public interest commitment, or we have Dot New York City, and in their public interest commitment, they, you know, they went against it. Only an injured party would be able to bring that up and possibly get some help from ICANN uh, contractual compliance. So the picks at the top level are something that I actually consider fairly farcical at the moment in that they really have no, no weight, they, they, they have no enforceability, but what they do have is the, a sort of a shiny promise of, of public interest commitment, but without any of the substance. And I, I, I admit that we never, as I say, considered the notion of the second level public interest commitment. We, we, we've had a certain amount of conversation, and very often these conversations, and I'm probably running on my 10 minutes, very often these conversations between top level domains and second level domains get, get confused. For example, people are now saying that any of the registries that are in certain fields or certain sensitive names should have these, um, I have a whole four minutes and a bunch left. Um, so basically that, um, you know, they're, they're asking for, for uh, advisory boards, public advisory boards to, to basically that. But that's still only at the top level and, and that's not enforceable either. So one of the things that we've had is sort of, the, there was a set of, of requirements for new GTLDs and there was a certain amount of an open market and as long as something was within the bounds of the law, it was within the bounds of the law, and ICANN, which is supposed to be coordinating names and numbers and assignable names and assignable numbers, is not supposed to be determining what happens with the content. 
it's it's not it doesn't regulate that it you know it has contracts it really isn't a regulatory instrument perhaps it does what we call regulation by contract which is sort of a new construct but but you know it is not a a, a regulatory body it is making policies on how these things are distributed on how these things are distributed fairly on making sure that the stability and security of the internet itself is maintained but not necessarily the security and stability of any particular entity any particular word so so we find that you know there's in the application guidebook and the period after that ICANN has, in an ad hoc way, added all these constructs, added the PICs, and, and now is being asked to, and I guess others will talk to that later, is being asked by the at-large advisory committee, the ALAC, to, to freeze certain applications unless they do certain things to please ALAC and sort of show themselves as as properly responsible um, according to somebody's set of guidelines. So these are, these are actually things that sort of disturb me. Now, a lot of people at the time were saying, well, maybe we should classify different kinds of, of top-level domains and sort of say, if you're a city one, you have this kind of rules. If you are a country one, you have this. If you're a protected industry like the finance industry, you have another. If you're a community, you have another. It was something I strongly resisted at the time because before this round, we didn't really know what the categories were going to be. I mean, we had some ideas, but we had no idea that half of the applications were going to be brands. You know, we, we, we didn't really think about the notion of there might be closed where someone, actually we did think about it, but in a different context, that it would be closed and someone would get a top level domain and use it solely for themselves, use it solely for their company, you know, but, but all of a sudden people sort of said, well, how could somebody possibly apply for the TLD book dot, dot book? and use that just for themselves, use that just for their own company. Unthinkable. Well, why was it unthinkable? You know, there are many other words, there are many other ways to designate the thing that we call a book. So why should that be public property? The whole notion of words as public property became very interesting, and that becomes sort of a notion of content control. And, and dividing that line between when you're making regulations for the fair distribution, use, and secure uh, internet so that the internet works properly versus when you start making considerations that sort of say you have to protect various industries, you have to protect various words, you have to protect content, I think starts to go beyond ICANN's mandate. And so I like a lot of these things. I think it's up to New York City, just to end on yours, that since New York City had to give permission for there to be such a, a TLD as .NYC, it was purely up to New York City to make the rules. And it should really have nothing to do with the rest of us at ICANN. So I use my 10 minutes. Thank you. Uh, Tom Lohenhaupt has developed digital marketing materials for the nation's leading banks and telecommunications firms. He's also a civic, civic activist who, in 2001, introduced an internet empowerment resolution to his community board, which was the Queens Community Board. It called for the acquisition and development of the .NYC TLD as a public interest resource. And he's the founding uh, director of Connecting uh, .NYC Incorporated, a New York State non-for-profit created in 2006 to advocate for the development of the .NYC TLD as a public interest resource. He's a member of uh, the Mayor's .NYC Community Advisor Board, and he received an undergraduate degree in government studies for uh, Queens College. He's also a graduate of NYU's Interactive Telecommunications Program and a co-organizer of tonight's event. So, Tom. And I'm also a board member of ISOC New York. Uh, so. Um, I'm uh, getting some assistance on these uh, slides here, and it's, uh, I don't have it in front of me, so it might be a little out of order, but uh, I'm going to talk about uh, three elements about public interest uh, 
uh, commitments and premium domain names. And then I'm going to present it as a question as to whether there should be them or not. Uh, so um, the first is I want to talk a little bit about uh, premium domain names, what they are. Uh, the uh, traditional view of them is that they're valuable names uh, set aside for distribution via an auction or a request for proposal process. Some of the uh, premium names for New York City might be names like hotels.myc, news.myc, pizza.myc. Uh, traditionally, these names are given out uh, when, they, uh, when they do that, they're given out um, uh, lock, stock, and barrel, so that if you're a uh, if you get the name uh, hotels.myc, uh, you're able to do, um, uh, uh, if you're Hilton and you buy hotels.myc, uh, you'll be able to do whatever you want with it. Just present all the Hilton hotels that there are. If you're the Washington Post and you buy news.myc, you'll be able to provide global news or uh, sports news and nothing local at all. And if you were Domino's and you bought pizza.myc, when you go to pizza.myc, you'd be able to see a map of uh, all the Domino's restaurants. That's if it was handled as a traditional TLD. And um, so uh, traditional TLD, the, the general metric for it is that it's uh, revenue. The more names, the more money, more, more names sold, the more money you get. And premium names was a, a good sort of money, a good sort of uh, revenue. So when uh, the, the Moby TLD was started some years ago, I think about 10,000 names were set aside as premium names and they were sold off slowly as it went along and uh, I don't know where they are in that process at this point. But there is a, a good thing about um, uh, the um, uh, about uh, the, uh, the process for distributing these. One of the good ways, good things about doing it through an auction is that it's fast and names get active very quickly. Uh, they avoid the uh, TLD problem that there is a, there's nothing there. You know, people think that in .info there's nothing there and they don't want to go there. So an auction gets the names out there fast. Uh, it's easy to administer. You don't have panels to review it. And it's also very transparent. So in a city situation, in a government situation, it's quite excellent that you don't have to worry about corruption. And I, I'm sure you can uh, uh, fake, uh, phony up uh, an auction as well, but it's uh, probably a little more difficult than some other processes. Uh, the, um, uh, and for a city, well, uh, with uh, traditional TLDs, the metric was uh, money, uh, essentially. With uh, city TLDs, it's improved social and economic life. And uh, within the context of premium domain names, uh, it's uh, improved navigability and new or improved markets are two of the main things that can be provided by these. And it, with .myc, we stand at this point where there are 65,000 .myc names that have been sold. And um, uh, most of the good names have, got, have been sold. Uh, and a good name, incidentally, is short, descriptive, and memorable. So 65,000 New York City name, .myc names have been sold. And the thing that I want to um, uh, talk about tonight particularly is the remaining unsold names. There are uh, three groups of unsold names, three lists of them. Uh, the reserve names, premium names, and collision names. And the, uh, I, I kind of refer to these as uh, opportunity names at this point. So we, we know what we don't have. You know, we don't have 65,000 names, but there are uh, about uh, 5,000 names out there that might be useful. Uh, for these uh, navigation and market purposes. And those are, or, or for as uh, premium names also. And uh, those are in three different groups. The, um, the first is the reserve names, uh, which are about 800 names. So the city has set aside uh, 800 names that are, uh, you can all see those, uh, I think. Uh, but uh, they're, they're mostly, these 800 names are, uh, half of them in neighborhood names. Uh, there is a lot of bids, business improvement districts, and the 60 community boards take in more than half of those names. But there are about 250 of them that are reserved, and these are names like dining.myc, access.myc, tours.myc, um, applied sciences.myc. So there are about 250 of those that uh, are, have been set aside for the city to develop. And they haven't really set up a real process for them. They've set up a bit of a process for the neighborhood names, but um, they uh, are unclear as to um, uh, what it would be in, uh, uh, for these other names. 
Uh, the second group of name are the uh, premium names. The city, there are 3,000 names set up that, that are set aside, 3,069 names that have been set aside, and a lot of these are uh, names like 777.myc, uh, hello.myc, and maybe very appropriately should be auctioned off. But there are a number of names on that same list that are very s similar to the reserve names. And uh, they could be very useful for, uh, for development and for having public interest commitments associated with them. Um, the uh, largest of those uh, three groups is this um, uh, uh, collision names, if you go a little further. Uh, that are, there are 17,000 of them, but most of them are pretty useless for our purposes uh, in, in the city here. And the column on the left there are the first uh, 10 of them in the city, and they're, they're, it's a rather complicated story as to where they came from, but the one on the right shows that there are uh, probably about 100 names within these 17,000 that are useful and could be used for civic development purposes. And uh, so what, what, uh, the thing I want to mention tonight is uh, we want to make a couple of recommendations. The first is that we think that it should be, the city should create a list of essential names that will advance the city's social and economic life. Names from all three of these lists should be combined. Uh, maybe that would be about 4,000 names. And then the city will have to negotiate with the contractor. What happened in the city here is that the city uh, signed a contract with this company, New Star, and they, sell, they set all the revenue, they, they share the revenue on a 60-40 basis. So New Star gets 60%, city gets 40%. New Star is investing a few million dollars to facilitate the city's acquisition of the domain name and the marketing of the names. And they were planning on getting that money back from the sale of the individual names, which they get about 10 bucks, and, but primarily from, or, or largely from the, uh, uh, from the premium names, from this list of 3,000 names or whatever. They want to sell them off and make a, as much as they can, and primarily sell them off through high bid auctions. So the city's going to have to negotiate with them to if they're going to readjust this list in some way. But we think it's an absolute necessity that they do that. You know, so there are certain names. If you can imagine that, if, if Pizza.myc was used uh, by Pizza Hut or Domino's, that that would show only the their their products. And that would harm the city's pizza industry. There would be no pizza industry. Anybody coming to New York as a tourist would look on pizza.myc and think that you know, we're a Pizza Hut city. So uh, uh, that it would be a, a step backwards. The TLD would not be performing its uh, purpose in that re regard. Uh, so then there would be two lists uh, from break the city, city government and or the pub hopefully the public would get engaged and make two lists uh, out, of, uh, out of all these names, these 4,000 names. One of them is the names that should be auctioned off immediately to make, meet this commitment, you know, 777.myc, hello.myc, what have you. And uh, the, the other is the names that would require public interest commitments. I've re spoken a bit about public interest commitments, but a number of these names should have public interest commitments. And the company can still auction these off, but if they're auctioning off uh, pizza.myc and it has public interest commitments associated with it, the city would probably get, perhaps would get less for it than they would if the company could buy it outright for their own purposes. So we think there should be um, uh, these, these two lists set up. And that, um, I think we have to go down a little bit. Uh, oh no, maybe that's it. So I, I think Avery talked about public interest commitments a little bit. But the, uh, one of them, <clears throat> uh, in today's news, uh, in today's ICANN news, there was a story about yesterday the dot baby name was auctioned off. And it was auctioned off for about $3 million. And Johnson & Johnson in New Jersey bought it. And they're going to use it for... Um, uh, for, for the, supposedly, uh, there's a big controversy whether it has, maybe Mr. McTim can uh, tell us a little bit about it, but they supposedly can auction them all, they can use it for, they can't use it for their own purposes, but uh, we will hear more about that. Yeah. It's a, it's, it is a closed. Uh, it, it is a closed. I hear, I hear otherwise, though, but uh, in any case, uh, and the city has, uh, uh, with uh, other ones, they have neighborhood names, uh, and they've said that the uh, community groups they to be set aside for community groups to develop new online hubs for civic engagement, online organizing, and information sharing. So this is, uh, this is a public interest commitment of sort for those 400 neighborhood names, but there are no other uh, public interest commitments that could be made. So our second recommendation is that there be, uh, that the city should create a public interest commitment guideline. Uh, things that you can do, things that you can't do. And the city should create, uh, where, uh, 
where this, the, the public interest commitment is presented we're on the, uh, the main homepage and what it includes. So these guidelines should have a general idea as to what that should be. And the public should be involved in this process. And the um, and our second, and with that, there needs to be a, some type of a public body, body to oversee this process and assure that there is compliance. So that in the, in the instance of a neighborhood name, for example, if uh, I live in Jackson Heights, and my next door neighbor is uh, Corona, so that if Corona.nyc is suddenly selling beer instead of facilitating the needs of the neighborhood, the city or this group would say, hey, wait, you know, you're not using it as a, um, as, as proposed. So. Uh, the summary is um, uh, that uh, the city needs to create a list. They need to check it tri twice with the city, with the public getting involved, and create a body to see who's been naughty and nice. Uh, so getting back to my original question as to whether we should uh, have public interest commitments for a .myc names, the answer is sometimes with some names. And uh, the noise, I'll just comment for those listening, it's a train going by outside, if you're wondering what that noise is on a periodic basis. It is the, anybody know what train it is? Uh, it's either the Q or N train in New York City, okay. Uh, and I think now we're going to hear from a third person. So my name is Tim McGinnis, I'm currently the registry administrator for Dodd Pharmacy. Um, like Aubrey, I've been involved in internet governance for uh, quite a long time. I was a former uh, RIPE NCC postmaster and trainer. That is the IP address registry for Europe, uh, Middle East, and Africa. Uh, later, I moved to Africa. I was the chairman of the policy working group for the African Regional Internet Registry, the IP address registry. Uh, I was an ISOC WISIS ambassador along with Aubrey in uh, 2004 and 2005. Um, and uh, I've worked for uh, the Internet Systems Consortium, the people who make buying. So I have a fairly broad background on, um, on internet infrastructure and the DNS in particular. Uh, currently as the registry administrator for Dot Pharmacy, I have um, some insight into the fixed specs and category one safeguards that we've implemented so I'm just here to give uh, some factual information about our TLD as needed. So I'm going to throw this over to Tom. Yeah, I'm, uh, Timothy, I was wondering if you could uh, give us your thoughts on public interest commitments and maybe how it relates to the dot pharmacy TLD. Well, uh, we have a different set of public interest commitments than the dot NYC domain. I put the link up in the chat uh, for the dot NYC pick specs, the public interest commitment specification. Ours are significantly longer uh, in that um, our specification 11 uh, mandates a, a variety of other things that the dot NYC doesn't. So we need to uh, ensure that people have licenses. Uh, we need to ensure that those licenses are authentic. Um, we need to liaise with the relevant national supervisory authorities regarding, because we're a highly uh, restricted, what's called a category one string, um, which means we're in a, or highly regulated industry. My uh, organization is the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy, and so it's an association of all the state regulators, uh, the Canadian provinces regulators, uh, the Australian and Guam and Puerto Rican and um, other jurisdictional regulators of the pharmaceutical industry. So we have a very extensive set of public interest uh, in addition to what it's called the Category 1 safeguards that were uh, demanded by the GAC, the Government Advisory Committee. Uh, in short, we have to um, restrict our TLD. So you have got 65,000 names sold in New York. We'll be lucky if we ever hit uh, 650 names in our TLD. 
So it's sort of like comparing apples and oranges. Yeah, okay. Um, I think that what we're going to do now is uh, we're going to hear from Gabriel, and David's going to introduce him, and sure. you'll stick around uh, for some questions. Sounds good. Tim? Yeah, sure. Okay. All right, thank you. All right, so, uh, next uh, we have Gabriel uh, Levitt, who is the vice president and co-founder of PharmacyChecker.com, which operates an online pharmacy verification program and compares pres prescription drug prices for consumers. <laughs> So Gabe is responsible for research standards and business development. And he's also a public advocate for pre prescription drug affordability, internet freedom, and the United Nations. Uh, he's testified before Congress on issues relating to access to affordable medicines and internet freedom, published an op-ed in the New York Times about online pharmacies and personal drug importation, and is the proud author of a chapter in an anthology about the defeat, the defeat of the Stop Online Piracy Act, SOPA. Gabe's president of the United Nations Association Brooklyn chapter and sits on the Brooklyn County Democratic Committee. He's also the recipient of the Margaret K. Bruce Advocacy Award for his work with the United Nations Association. Gabe received his master's in international relations from American University and a bachelor's degree in international relations and political science from Roger Williams University. Okay, um, so the topic, uh, the topic is kind of broader and more narrow. The topic is online access to safe and affordable medication and what I view as the problem of the dot pharmacy application. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So you already know about us. Uh, we were founded over 10 years ago. And uh, we help people find uh, safe and affordable medication over the internet. Next slide, please. Um, I just want to remind us that the, that the mission of the Internet Society is to promote the open development, evolution, and use of the Internet for the benefit of all people. Online access to safe and affordable prescription medication is one of those benefits. And uh, I believe that did, did discouraging, curtailing, but especially blocking online access to safe and affordable medication it's more than internet censorship like we saw in SOPA, but it veers off into a violation of human rights. Next slide, please. Just quickly, the United Nations Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, just to remind you, uh, holds that access to medicine is, in fact, a human right. Next slide, please. Yes. Yes. Uh, online pharmacies help people and they hurt people. Uh, they offer people lower prices, convenience and, and, and anonymity. And um, uh, for those Amer Americans who cannot afford prescription drugs here, who, who uh, buy them from Canada and other countries, it gives them some uh, modicum of consumer drug justice. Um, people have also been hurt by buying medications online. There's a lot, lot of broke websites out there. And so we do need the safeguards that Tim was uh, telling you about. But as I'm about to explain, the NABP standard goes way too far. Uh, next slide, please. I won't take any more time to brag about what we do, but we do evaluate online pharmacies and we've been doing it for over 10 years and we've helped many, many people. Next, next, next slide, please. High drug prices in America, America, America are a public health crisis. Um, 50 million Americans, 50 million Americans did not fill a prescription in 2012 
thousands of dollars per year. And so those, those online pharmacies help people who would otherwise go without uh, med medication that was prescribed by their doctor. Next slide, please. Um, it's, it's a whole presentation unto itself, the laws and the regs. But as some of you might know, according to the FDA, it's actually technically illegal under most circumstances to get a drug from Canada or from the UK, even if it's the exact same drug sold here. However, uh, the FDA has never prosecuted an individual for importing drugs, at least if it's for their own use. And according to the CDC, 5 million uh, Americans import drugs each year. Next slide, please. The drug companies are not happy about this because it undermines their profits. According to the Wall Street Journal in 2003, drug company profits are threatened as more Americans buy their medicines from cheaper markets, particularly Canada. And that's when the online pharmacy industry started to blow up. And what the drug companies did, they engaged a PR firm uh, to find out how to end this threat. And what Edelman PR told the drug companies is that they should question the safety and the effectiveness of medicines procured elsewhere. When people hear that the drugs they import might be substandard or counterfeits, the report says, it shatters the impression that the cheaper medicines are the same as more costly American drugs. Next slide, please. So how has Big Pharma worked to undermine online access to affordable medicine? We all know that they have the biggest lobbying group in D.C. Two, they've actually cut supplies to pharmacies in Canada that sell into the U.S. And then they use scare tactics to conflate rogue online pharmacies with safe international online pharmacies. So they've actually cut supplies, their own, to pharmacies in Canada that are selling to the U.S. Now those are obviously their own drugs. And then saying that they're all rogue sites. And the other thing that they do is they fund dot pharmacy. So who's paying for this new top level do, 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 domain? Um, now, before I go into that, um, next slide, please. I'm not jo joking. In 2005, Pharma commissioned the um, publication of a fictional novel about terrorists who poisoned drugs ordered online from Canada. For whatever reason, the uh, writers in Big Pharma fell out of paper, and what ended up being published is something called the uh, Parzik Conspiracy, in which a large pharmaceutical company uh, poses uh, as, a I mean, po po poisons the dr drugs from Canada and then blames it on a group of terrorists. Next slide, please. So let's talk about dot pharmacy uh, GTLD. The applicant is the NABP, and they say the purpose is to ensure the dot pharmacy GTLD shall serve as a trusted space for legitimate online pharmacies. We believe that their their policies, their their picks, actually get to impose a discriminatory policy under which any non-U.S. online pharmacy that sells into the U.S. is not allowed to have a farm, farm, pharmacy. The NABP states that they are an impartial professional organization here to promoting public health. Now, I don't doubt that about some of their programs, but the NABP program, in my opinion, next slide please, are not impartial. I won't even go down the list, but they are discriminatory uh, they're funded by F F F Pfizer and other drug companies, and they pretty much scare Americans from getting a medication anywhere but from the U.S. online pharmacy. Next slide, please. 
while funding doesn't always shape a policy, in the case of dot pharmacy, yes, according to the NABC, this is who is funding dot pharmacy. Uh, Eli Lilly, Merck, Pfizer, ne ne next slide please. And then these are all the other groups that are su support supporting the other drug companies, U.S. pharmacies, other groups that are funded by drug com companies. Next slide please. What does Peter Maybardew say about all this? Peter Maybardew is the director of the Access to Medicines Project at Public Citizen. He says, I can should reject the NABP's application for the generic top-level domain dot pharmacy for reasons of public interest. Granting the dot pharmacy domain to NABP would, would confer legitimacy on pharmacies sanctioned by NABP to the detriment of those that are not. Next slide, please. This gentleman is Lee Grachik from a group called rxrights.org um, that advocates for more affordable medication. He went to the ICANN meeting back in October and presented to the board a petition of 25,000 Americans, speaking of the public interest, to oppose NABP's dot pharmacy application for the reasons that I've stated. Next slide, please. What's the status? Uh, the NABP has executed the re registry agreement with ICANN. We've actually opened it up to those entities who are uh, signed up with ICANN's trademark clearinghouse, and they plan a more general um, uh, enrollment in 2015. And according to Tim, they foresee a very narrow enrollment, an exceedingly narrow enrollment of our re 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 registers because they have the backing to keep it that way. And um, is there any chance it might be postponed? Well, the ALAC uh, has asked ICANN to postpone all of their re re regulated strains, including dot pharmacy. The, uh, the bid business community su supports ALAC's request, and the GAC has cr criticized ICANN for not heeding its advice as well on the re re regulated string. Next slide, please, and then I'm almost done. Um, how can NABP misuse dot pharmacy? Mostly, it will further the interests that I believe fund it to continue to say the only good online pharmacies are those with dot pharmacy, so it must be a U.S. online pharmacy. I believe that they will work with their friends in Washington to introduce le le legislation to use that dot pharmacy lever to uh, pass laws that will ban any other online pharmacy, even from appearing on organic search results. And this is something that has been discussed. Um, uh, I mean, okay, let me just go on to the next slide. What can the Internet Society do? They can issue a statement that the internet should be used to maximize access to health care, including safe and affordable medication. That GTLDs in regulated areas, such as dot pharmacy, should not be funded by companies that stand to gain commercially from a discriminatory re registration, from discriminatory re registration policies. To issue a statement acknowledging that consumers need to be protected from dangerous rogue online pharmacies, but that they should also not be deprived access to those that sell safe and affordable medication, even if based in other countries. And finally, issue a statement that the levers of internet governance, governance should not be used to enforce laws that impede access to healthcare, including safe and affordable med med medication. Thank you for giving me some Extra time. I appreciate it. I have a, I have a question. Um, I think I could be heard. Um, 
how does this relate to the public interest commitment in the .NYC domain? That's actually a question. It doesn't, but when when I met with Tom, he said, I think I was I think I was invited here to give other perspectives on you know what's happening with uh, public, how can we learn from public interest. Can I uh, interject, Tom? You can learn. You you can learn about larger uh, it issues on how top level GTLDs can be used to the debt to the advantage of, of big mul multinational drug companies to the de detriment of consumers who uh, might be seriously disadvantaged by that standard. For a second. Yeah. <clears throat> I suggested that uh, Greg Gabriel Gabriel uh, join the, the uh, panel because I thought it would be instructive on how it controls markets by using uh, how a domain name can control a market. So in, in our case, we had like pizza was owned by one company and it would exclude other people in that, the, the whole industry that we have in the city and world renowned industry would, uh, if Pizza Hut owned dot pizza, uh, pizza.nyc rather, uh, it would change that entire industry possibly. So I thought uh, Gabriel's uh, uh, insight into that might be, uh, how it worked with dot pharmacy might be uh, instructive uh, for this. Uh, Avery seems like she has a, a thought or I something. Have, yeah, I, so. I, 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 can I, I interject a fact before yeah, uh, Avery weighs in? I, and I'll mm -hmm. hand it to him in a second, but what I think we learned here is how in both dot NYC and at the higher level, people believe there are magic words. People that believe that there are words that are invested with such magic that if dot pharmacy is, I don't know. Yes. Yeah. Can I be heard? So anyhow, people believe that there are words that are imbued with such magic that if dot pharmacy is used by one group and dot drugstore or dot drugs online or some other thing were to have been used by another, that, that, that somehow a disparity has been created in the commercial market, as opposed to somebody applied for dot pharmacy, someone did not apply for dot online drugstores, or, or however you want to put it, and all of a sudden they're sort of saying, this is a special word, this is a magic word, and unless you restrict it. Now, with dot NYC, you could do valuable things with pizza.nyc, not sell it for big bucks, but use it for the city to actually register, you know, joes.pizza.nyc and, you know, New York, et cetera, that you could use it that way as a public service. But the fact is, even the word pizza is not a magic word. And I, I, I really find it hard to believe that you injure the, the New York pizza market by letting Domino's have it. I mean, if, if, if they buy it and they give you the money, if, if money is what is important. Um, I think that if New York City wants to use these names for public service, then it really should use them for public service and, and use them as an index, set up, a, you know, set up something that actually New York City keeps them as it's keeping some of its other names and actually finds a way to use them. But the whole notion that there are magic names that somehow will tilt an industry one way or another is just something that I don't think is a well-founded thought. Yeah, I, I agree with that, Arvind. Yeah. Uh, uh, can I just say that um, uh, Gabriel's presentation, while informative, was uh, behind the times, shall we say. We are not an applicant. We are an actual TLD, just like NYC. We're uh, in the root zone. We have names in the zone. We can't be postponed. So um, much of that, of the opposition dot pharmacy has come about because we are a strict public interest commitment. So in the case of NYC, we want stricter public interest 
and the ALAC is called for, and the GAC is called for stronger public interest commitment. The, but the opposition to dot pharmacy is in areas where they want weaker public interest commitment. So there uh, are folks on both uh, both sides of the equation. Uh, we've committed to very strong public interest commitments in our contract, and we uh, have committed to the Category 1 safeguards. So uh, we understand that our definition, say, a rogue pharmacy is different than pharmacy checkers, uh, but we can't act any other way than we are acting because our public interest commitments say that we can't do business with people who break the law. So I can is not the place to change the FDA regulation or U.S. laws. Congress uh, is the place to do that about uh, importation of drugs into the United States being illegal. So the dot pharmacy DLB is about uh, safe online pharmacy, uh, whereas the pharmacy checker would like us to be about safe and, and affordable. Um, as the association pharmaceutical regulators, pharmacy regulators, sorry, in each state, uh, we are about safe pharmacy, not about um, price. And, and just a personal anecdote, I heard from one of our uh, public, one of our advisory board members in the pharmaceutical industry, and yes, we've been completely transparent that they have funded uh, pharmacy in part. Uh, the rest has come from uh, NABP. So I've lived overseas for the last, uh, much of the last 15 years, and I was talking to him about you know, overseas pharmacies, and he says, you know, the paradigm has shifted. Drugs are now cheaper in the United States. And I thought, well, that's interesting. So a month ago, I went and picked up a prescription and uh, a 30 day supply of medication cost me $6. And I looked at and of generic medication. And I looked at the pharmacy checker website and uh, they do a very nice price comparison there. And the price of the same generic was 33 to 36 US dollars. So, uh, I tend to believe that the uh, generics are now cheaper in many cases in the United States than overseas. So, I guess in general, uh, I'm saying that the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy, as a registry operator, must abide by its public interest commitments and Category 1 safeguards. Uh, otherwise, we would lose our, um, our status as a registry operator. Uh, ICANN would cancel our contract. So we, we have to do what we're doing in terms of verifying licensures and verifying that people obey the laws in the jurisdictions in which they operate, in which their customers reside. Um, I think we have no, no other choice but to obey our pick specs. I'd like to respond, but I'll, I'll just yield and let Mr. Public get some questions from out here first. Can you check that mic? Yeah, yeah, the mic was shut off, so uh, now it's turned on. Okay, okay so there we go. Yeah, um, I, I'm a little concerned, but I think there's some very interesting issues, and in some ways, dark pharmacy may be a magic word in that it's subject to legal regulation, but pizza isn't, or only to a very limited extent. I am a bit concerned, though, which I was questioning, you know that we not just, I think we could talk for hours about pharmacy and drugs and a lot of problems there. I'm, I'd like us though to get back to DIMYC and the situation we're in. And it seems to me there's, you know, that with what the city has done with the neighborhood names does provide essentially a licensing agreement for use of those names. And that could be used for domain names that are considered in the public interest. The practical problems may be, though, in terms of names that are not in the reserved list, but that we think should be in this public interest thing. Interestingly enough, hotels.nyc is in the city's reserved list. Hotel.nyc is a premium name. Um, and I think the city may have missed out on an opportunity to reserve some of the names, for example, pizza.nyc. And I think one of the questions is, to what extent is the city locked into 
uh, limit, it, to what extent is the city able to reserve some of the names that are now on the premium list, either you know, either through eminent domain uh, or through uh, through negotiation with New Star. It seems to me if they could be brought into the reserved name, then they could it'd be relatively easy to set up a licensing agreement that requires some reasonable public interest commitment. Well, I, I put up a, a link on the, in the chat window to show you the pick spec, the public interest commitment that uh, Newstar has signed with uh, ICANN. So that's what uh, they must do. What they will do uh, is a different story. Their registry policy, uh, they in the city of New York can make whatever agreement they want. They can certainly move those names if they want from the premium name list to the reserve list. Hello, hello, I'm Art. I actually run a meetup group for that NYC names also, <laughs> Tom. And uh, uh, more of a comment really than a question. Uh, my view is uh, that uh, it really depends. Like I agree with uh, Avery that it's de de on certain names. It doesn't. I don't think it really matters that much because you know people will do unless there is a specific plan of what to do. Uh, vice versa, I think that, uh, especially with the names that have been reserved already, the question is, what is happening with them? Is these 400 neighborhoods, how many of them has been actually somebody applied to develop? Uh, how, many of the, how many of them are being developed? Because it's been two, three months now, and uh, are there actual applications? Are there uh, anything going on? Because we can, uh, there, there, we can reserve 2,000 names or 5,000, 10,000 names, but if there is nothing done, with that, there is no plan or some kind of action. I think that's an issue. So, uh, to me, question is, what is being, what does the city do for uh, the names they reserved already? They can get more names. I'm completely fine with it. But the question is, are they actually doing something with the names they already reserved? Is it just there to hang out for years and years to come, or there's something to do? Like if it's, if somebody gonna buy pizza, I think there should be uh, you know something like we're gonna if you buy that name like super premium name, let's put a uh, addition there that we're gonna de develop it. You can't just buy it and redirect. I I completely agree. There should be that simple little thing saying you can if you're gonna buy uh, a name like hotel.nyc, then you gotta develop it. it, it I don't care if it's chain of hotels or one hotel, but whoever buys it, they have to develop it. They can just redirect. I see a lot of that NYC names being redirected. Not, not premium, but not premium. Uh, and especially with premium names, I think that's where the issue will be. If it's Pizza Hut developing pizza, I'm okay with it. It's actually actual useful app and they're doing something. But if they just have pizza that NYC and they own it for three years and they're sitting and doing nothing on it, that's where I have an issue. So if they're developing it, that's fine. If it's pre especially for premium names, because that's, it might not be typing right now, but people might start typing in, in next year, two years, three years. So that's my view, and I would like to hear panel a little bit on that. Yeah, I just have to talk a little bit about the history of this. Uh, the, Bloomberg administration signed the contract with Newstar without any public engagement and without, with very little thought on the part of what token, they were. Token public engagement. Very, very little. Token is even very better. Little, token, token public engagement, and uh, and the um, new administration is, is looking into it in more detail. But this is something that could take years to to do and should have taken started years ago. Uh, I like what the Lazio administration is doing with the neighborhood names. They have set them aside. There is a, 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 a website, neighborhoods.myc, where one could go and apply for a neighborhood name. And uh, there's, they're setting up, they're looking to set up a panel to evaluate those. So the neighborhood names, I think, are moving along a bit. Uh, the other names are, uh, it's unknown. They, they, you know, there really is not a, an ex extended process for that. And uh, I think public engagement would enable it uh, enable the, the public to uh, participate in deciding how they're used, where they're used, and uh, who develops them. And I think that uh, the more public engagement there is, 
the the better off the TLD will go. But it's it's got to be it, to be done well. It's 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 uh, uh, probably going to take a, a bit of a bit of time. Uh, one thing is that um, when we had the meeting with Fadi Shahadi a couple of weeks back, you know, and Gail Brewer, you know, she had promised when we did have, there was a hearing on the public contract, and, you know, it was very rushed because they left it to the last minute before they applied, you know, and then they had this hearing. But she said there would be public hearings on this at that, and so when we met with Fadi Shahadi, she reaffirmed the fact that we would have proper public hearings about what happens with the reserve names and all this kind of thing. And then the other thing is that, you know, Tom has worked on this for years and we, you know, we looked at what happens in neighborhoods and, <clears throat> and there are certain examples that people have very successful bulletin boards in some neighborhoods, there's very successful blogs in other neighborhoods and so on. And after, you know, and then we encountered uh, Richard who's here somewhere from uh, Wikimedia NYC and we said, maybe you know, the answer might be to make something like Wikipedia-like, you know, where every you know, domain name maps to like an area, to a sort of mini Wikipedia, not the same as Wikipedia, not you know, more free to like serving the local community, but something like that. So there's a whole, that was a whole other, and we actually started it. We, there is a wiki, if you go to wikinyc.org, you can see our our nascent idea, which never took off, I have to say, but to me it still is a possibility to run something that's completely sort of non-commercial, you know, bottom-up kind of thing like that on the neighborhoods. I have a question. So, pass it to Uh, yeah, in terms of, I, I think it's a terrible pity that 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 you have a contract with New Star that 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 could almost make you do things that are against New York's public interest. And I'm wondering, with these reserve names now, the the the, the fact that they get 60% is also somewhat obscene. But is there something that actually forces .dot NYC? to put those premium names out for bid? Or can NYC just sort of decide to sit on them until such time as they find and have resolved the, the public interest uh, type of agreements? And I think in terms of your thing, uh, just a quick answer, in terms of the top level domains, there was a policy that was put on that sort of said you had to put them out. I don't know about develop them, but you certainly had to, to use them, to put them in the root within a certain amount of time. So I think that it would not be unreasonable for a regulator to be able to say, these are the things that are really supposed to be up to the original registries to be able to figure out what was the best way for them to create what it is they wanted. That was one of the reasons why, as a GNSO, you know, generic name supporting organization, we did not make rules. You know, because we figured that, that, that the communities, that New York City, that pharmacies, what have you, would come up with their own creative ways to use these things. So I, I, I really actually hope that NYC finds a way to, to use its names. I like whether it's the, the, the Wikipedia or Wikimedia or, or whatever type of idea that's attached to a name and opens up, I think those are the great things and those are the development things that could be really valuable to see happen. So I really hope that you guys aren't trapped by a new star contract to sell things that you don't want to sell. Tom, could you speak about the role of the advisory council? <clears throat> well, there has been a, a Dot NYC advisory board uh, that uh, Robert Pollard uh, and I are on, and I don't know if anyone else here is on it, but uh, that was in existence for two years and expires at the end of the month. And what follows it is, is unknown. And uh, we've met, uh, th under the de Blasio administration, we've met monthly, and it's been a positive experience. And we're hoping that uh, there's a, a new uh, governance process that follows through. 
Uh, yesterday we had an hour and a half meeting in City Hall on the topic, and we went through a very e interesting exercise trying to figure out what the governance process should be and how it should work. So uh, I don't know how that's going to work out. I don't know when these public hearings that uh, Gail referred to, Borough President uh, Gail Brewer referred to, are going to be held as, uh, they're not citywide, they're not the mayor's hearings. I really think the mayor should support hearings. They should be, they should go to community boards. They should have done this years ago, you know. At, at this point, it's a real detriment to the TLD, the fact that all these names are sitting idle and not being developed, these uh, reserve names, you know, hundreds of good names that are just idle. You know, I would hate to see the city you know, people to think that the TLD was a useless, uh, uh, a useless information tool. So, uh, I hope there is a way that we can speed things up. Uh, can I just add? That, uh, can I just uh, make that it is important to distinguish between the reserved names, which the city could organize in whatever commitments, and the premium names, which my understanding is that that's a contract, that's part of the contract with Newstar, that they have the right to sell these premium names. And again, the only question was whether that could be changed would be some kind of leverage of the contract with, uh, with Newstar. But they, they're interested in selling domains and making money. Well, they must admit that looking over the, the premium names they've got, a lot of them don't seem that interesting. <laughs> Other questions? This is a question and somewhat of a comment, but I, I remember, um, yeah, it's a question and somewhat of a comment, but I remember, um, I think it was in the, I have to agree with Avery on this. Um, so, uh, yeah, my name is Michael, I'm a board member of Internet Society of New York. Um, but I, I remember in the 90s, or uh, mid 90s when toll-free numbers were going from 800 to 866 to 888 and there was this same conversation exact same conversation going on because this was pre-internet and there were organizations like 1-800 flowers that were really serious about um, making sure that they were able to get the same 866-888 and so on and it turned out it was a non-issue, right? People, similar to what you said, figured out a way to just make. But one thing the FCC did, which I think is instructive and maybe something that can be done in this, in this same uh, instance, is they set up this group of RESPOR or responsible organizations that instead of going to say New Star, right? There was a community type of organization that would that you had to apply through. That would actually, if there was a conflict, they would manage it and reconcile that conflict. And they were a organization that that actually had a contract. Because I think the problem here is when you have New Star, which actually benefits financially, there's a there's, a, there's an issue, but if there was a way to, to use an organization like Thomas's, Tom's to actually be the responsible community organization in between to reconcile, it seems like that might be a model to think about. It's supposed to be important. Maybe one more. Get a word in. Let me one more question. This gentleman over here has a question. Hi, I'm Mike Caprio, uh, just entrepreneur, private citizen, member of Internet Society. Um, so I, I also, I, I just, I'm going to echo maybe some of what um, was just said, but I do also agree with, with Aubrey. And um, I think that really what we want to talk about, I, I think the community thing is great, the fact that we're reserving communities. I think what's really important is underrepresented groups. Um, I think that we really should, uh, maybe, maybe it's too late, maybe New Star doesn't really have this in the contract or whatever, but um, something like the Wiki idea or something like where we provide uh, for groups that are across the digital divide, for groups that are, aren't underrepresented, maybe we could get them some reduced cost hosting services, reduced cost domain names. Um, that's the kind of thing that's really important. I would even go so far as to say that there are probably areas within the underrepresented neighborhoods that are streets 
or business improvement districts, which also could benefit from this kind of uh, support. So just, uh, again, that's, that's I, I, I think there is no magic naming, uh, but I do think that there are important issues that definitely need to be addressed that are NYC-centric. Um, thank you. Let's go to Tim. Tim? Yeah, well, um, I have a, a number of things to say about the, that. Are you asking for, say, uh, New Star to sell names at the third level under pizza.nyc or hotels.nyc? They, they could easily do that. They could do a registry services evaluation process with ICANN and get the ability to sell those third level domains. Um, so that's one, one way to do it. But I, Newstar is uh, the dot pharmacy uh, registry backend provider, and they've been very flexible with us. And uh, they are not expensive, and they're doing the dot pharmacy project because uh, they have, are also committed to safe online pharmacy. Um, and I know that the point person at Newstar uh, is a New Yorker, and he's very you know bullish on making dot ny succeed nyc succeed and not just in making money so i think there is an opportunity for you um as an isoc actor as a, a city tlb to come up with some ways to uh use the tlb either the second or third level uh to promote the public interest um but you know, it's going to be what we call it at ICANN a, a multi-stakeholder process. So you need the city, the government, you need the private sector, New Star, you need civil society, all the neighborhood groups, uh, and ISOC and the folks you've been talking about. Uh, everybody's got to you know pitch in together. If you come up with a set of rules with only one or two groups of people involved, then a few years down the line you'll find that other groups of people are going to kvetch about it. Yeah, well, it would be great if we had some multi-stakeholder governance here, if the public had some participation. The public has no participation at this point, virtually none. This uh, advisory board that I'm on is very nice for the 10 of us that are on the board, but there, as we said before, there have been no public hearings, there's no public engagement. Uh, there is, the last time, when uh, two years ago almost at this point, when we tried to get some neighborhood names back, New Star started saying, well, you want those names? We want more names then. We want to take other names to auction off. They're not in it to develop the city, and to my mind, they're in it to make money, which is fine for them, and the city should have a process to say that we're developing this to make the, a better city, and I don't think they have that perspective yet. You know, I think that they, someone has to emphasize to them that this is an important resource for our city, that we have to th carefully think it through, and you know, we, we just got stuck with this Bloomberg, um, this Bloomberg contract, which is really killing us. It's, it's really hard to get out of it. You know, New Star put in a few million dollars. Naturally, they want their money back. So now the de Blasio's administration is going to have to spend money somehow if we're going to get out of this uh, conundrum that we're in. And I think that we should really, because a lot of people came here for a party, which we promised as well. So, and the beer has run out. I'm the official beer getter. So I'm going to go uh, run and get some okay. beer. And uh, David's going to say, and uh, the others, uh, uh, I'm on my way for beer. Be back in a minute. Um, well, I do apologize if I took too much time on, on the dot pharmacy issue, but I was invited to, to um, uh, talk about it. Tim, Tim and I do not agree with um, each other on this issue, and I think that names do matter, and I think you'll, you'll be reading about in the next year or two how the uh, pharmaceutical industry plans to use dot pharmacy. And Tim said that the concerns of the NABP are safe online pharmacies. Well, we share that, but if a drug isn't affordable from a safe online pharmacy, then it's not that safe because the person won't get the medication that they need. I guess the only thing I'd say is it's too bad that New York City didn't apply as a community uh, and didn't manage to keep 
on Newstar from turning it into a cash cow. And I wish you the best of luck because I don't know what I can do to help, but if you can think of anything, I think it's really too bad. So really, good luck. <laughs> oh, okay, I'm good. I, I don't need a microphone because I have one. Okay, so we just want to quickly thank all the people who have made, uh, institutions that have made this possible. Obviously, the Brooklyn Law School and the Brooklyn Law Innovation Program for the use of this room. And of course, Jolly, who is uh, just a stalwart to support of the uh, Internet Society of New York for recording and streaming this event and doing other wonderful things. And of course, for the Global uh, Internet Society, which has provided a grant, for, uh, an event grant, which is covering in part the cost of our refreshments. Uh, in case there's anybody here who's not a member of the Internet Society, please go to the Internet Society's website, ISOC, isoc.org, become a member, and specify uh, that you're a, you want to join the New York chapter. That's a basic membership's free of charge, and we need lots of members. So thanks very much, and let's go on to the next thing, which is our party. Thank you.